Hey there, everybody, and welcome to the Fearless Road podcast, where we explore entrepreneurial insights, stories, and advice on embracing fear, breaking boundaries, and achieving goals on the road to success. I'm your host, Michael DeVu. And after years of overcoming obstacles and tragedy, I began to wonder, how does someone become fearless? Well, that's exactly what we're going to find out. In every episode, we dive into the lives of individuals who've learned to turn fear into fuel, face some incredible challenges, and cultivate a fearless mindset while navigating their fearless road. So join me for in-depth interviews with some amazing people where we investigate more deeply the valleys on their road to success because the valleys are where character is built, foundations are laid, and where the fearless are born. Welcome to the Fearless Road Podcast. Okay, yeah. let's jump in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Fearless Road podcast. This is part two of my interview with Santu Carter. Um, in part one, we briefly touched on the concept of dynamic diversity and how your name specifically reflects your work as a bridge between people and their healing journeys. And in part two of our discuss discussion, we're going to explore a couple of key areas. One is finding strength and resilience. And two is living a full life despite loss. So if you will, please, can you share with us a little bit more on your background and your experiences that led you to this path um, in the area of, of loss? Yeah, well, loss has been a theme, a major theme in my life since childhood, because I come from a family who are genocide survivors and um, eventually we settled into a country where I was born. And then five years later, when I was five years old, there was a major civil war that broke out and I was a child war refugee. And then we had to dislocate and move to another country, um, a country where I didn't know the language. And it created a lot of uh, confusion, you know, loss, um, loss of security of my old home, loss of familiar familiarity. And, uh, you know, it, it was quite a struggle. Uh, and so what I would I imagine a loss, a, a sense of self, uh, uh, like you had your identity yeah. just barely, you know, and then, then, then all of a sudden it was tied to all these things, right? As we, as we yeah. enter the world through the lens of our caretakers, our parents and our spaces, we forget that we immediately begin to identify the world around us to ourselves and that that begins to say oh i am this thing and this person here in this space and that's suddenly ripped away I, I can't imagine how jarring that must feel it's like it's like the death of a loved one really um because you're searching yeah. for something familiar and it's not there it's very much like a death uh, and I know I struggled in the first um, several years I, I don't know how many years I struggled but um, I was in primary school uh, or elementary school uh, when I arrived in the country. And uh, those first few years were really hard um, because I could barely speak. I could I could not understand others and I couldn't be understood. Now, there is something there. Yes. I couldn't be understood. Yes. Uh, and that's that something must have I hear from grievers all the time. They yeah. don't understand. Yeah. They judge me. They don't understand. You know, that the theme is pretty large. Yes. In one's life, yeah. Being understood, I think, is, I think we take it for granted, you know, until we aren't. You know, we, we, we think we can communicate. We think we can tell people what we need and what we want. But when we're lost in a space where our words and the way we're using them is no longer communicating what we need, mm. feeling unmoored and untethered from your own sense of who you are and what, you, what, you know, when people don't get you can be terrifying i imagine yeah it it feels devastating yeah it's uh yeah it is it is it is really hard and that and i you know i was reflecting earlier today that that wound still kind of lives in me and comes up in unexpected times so even now as an adult when i'm confused or can't communicate or can't be understood those old feelings come up like from when I was a child 
and they come up suddenly and I may sometimes burst into tears from frustration. And, you know, that's like grief that it sort of surfaces and comes up unexpectedly in the form of tears or, yeah, frustration, anger, all sorts of emotions, really. Mm. How, how, well, let, I'd say let's go from, that was your early childhood. Can I ask where, where you were a refugee from? Uh, Lebanon. The, Lebanon? the country okay. was Lebanon, yeah. And did you, what country were you moved to? Was it America? Oh, you know where did I move to? No, it was Canada. Oh, Canada. Well, at least among nice people. <laughs> I mean, the Canadians are, if anything, they're very nice people. <laughs> I mean, compared to, you know, Americans, we tend to be a bit harsh. I imagine our environment is not as friendly or welcoming. Was it? Did you find that to be something you compared to well, because you came from Canada to here? Um, I, well, you have to remember that when I moved to Canada, I was amongst children and I didn't okay. dress the same. I didn't have the same yes. accent and children can be quite judgmental. They're not always the most gracious um, yes. when you're in school. So yeah, I didn't have the easiest time when I when I first started by the time I got to high school it was okay things had leveled out I you know picked up the Canadian accent and I sounded like everyone else and yeah it was okay it was it was better in high school and I really made an effort to reach out and make friends make make close good friends so um, I was proactive in kind of creating a community that was accepting of me and that's something that I want to say about those who are grieving that sometimes you can withdraw and you can feel lonely and isolated and your support network might be gone. And that's the time it's hard, but that's the time when you need to be proactive and reaching out to people who are understanding and going to be supportive. So that's, that's important that, that you can't just wait for, you know, other people to reach out. Sometimes the one that's had the loss has to do the reaching out. When we're in that space, um, and I'll say this as entrepreneurs, not just as a normal human, um, we, normal human, <laughs> like, like, like entrepreneurs are superhumans or something, but I, I mean, I suppose they are in some ways, you know, they, they tackle things on a regular basis that most individuals and would just be like, no, thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to go down that path. Uh, mainly because we invite it, you know, as entrepreneurs, mm. we invite additional struggle obstacles challenges by putting ourselves our dreams our ambitions out there in the world yeah um but there's a part of us i think that wants to minimize and compartmentalize some of those struggles and so when the very thing that we need to do is to reach out what we end up doing is sort of putting it aside sort of giving it going like in a little tidy little box and saying you know when i get to you later i've, I've really got some important things to deal with and we get very good at peace, dividing ourselves up into the parts that can deal with specific things at specific times. And so eventually what, what we've discovered is the very thing that we needed to do originally, we've put off for so long. I think you mentioned before, like this, uh, it was for, for part of my problem was shoving the, ball, the, the little blue, red ball down <laughs> under the water until it finally just explodes and it, you know, it can't take the pressure anymore. How do you help us come to terms with the fact that what we probably need to do is bring it to the surface and ask for that help? When what 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 can we do to identify uh, that that very need or that very moment when maybe that is the thing that is stopping us from progressing, and we're uh, not aware of it? Right, we've trained ourselves not to be. Mm. I think. The best advice uh, that I would say for that is to really discern who is on your side, in a sense, who offers compassion towards you. So family and friends that we used to have may, may not be the most supportive anymore once you've experienced a significant loss. And so you have to become really discerning. It's almost like fine-tuning your antenna 
to know who to reach out to that's appropriate for this particular stage in your life. So the grief stage, the intensity stage. And I would also say that there are people soon discover that there are different types of friends and there might be, of course, good, yes, absolutely. There might be good friends or there might be a friend that, that was really good friends in the past. And then all of a sudden they become either illiterate or judgmental about your grief and go, are you still grieving? Like, can't you get over it? And when they say <laughs> things like that, it doesn't yeah. mean, oh, these people don't understand anything. I'll just cut them out of my life. Like it's tempting to cut them out. But what you can discern is that mm, this friend just wants the good times. They just want to be happy and uh, positive. And so you can reach out to them when you're in a good place. So grief kind of swings back and forth like a pendulum, right? Sometimes you're having dark days and low days, and then sometimes you swing out of that. And for your, you know, I don't, I don't know, an hour, a day, depending on the person, when you're on the upswing, that's the friend that you, you contact, say, want to go to a movie or want to go for a walk in the park, right? And you'll learn not to contact them when you're in your dark space. And you find other friends that you can contact when you're in a low space or a dark space, right? Who will be there for you, giving you the hugs and just the, the quiet that you might need, the silence that you might need and or a meal that you might need. So it's having to learn who to reach out to and when because our emotions can be all over the place when you're grieving and in loss. So it's about learning, uh, learning what feeling you have and who the best person would be. It's kind of like having a toolbox and knowing which tool to use for the right job, right? So you have to pick and choose the right tool, uh, you know, for different projects. And in that sense, it, that's what you need to do with friends as well. Pick and choose who the right person is to connect with for the emotion that you're so feeling. It, yes. I mean, I don't know that we, I'm sure that we do on some level identify our friends and the people around us as that individual, you know, that, well, oh, that's the, that's the person I go to for this. That's the person. We may not say it specifically in those words, but we know because our filters have identified who we turn to when we want fill in the blank. And I'm curious if there's, if you could suggest for us when a, when a big tragedy happens, um, a moment bigger than, than the usual challenges that we normally will face. And we can call that death of a loved one. We can call that the, the loss of a friend uh, or a relative or a loved one. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean death. We could lose them in a number of different ways. Yeah. Um, is there a, is there a set of like three or four things we can do steps we can take to, 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 to give ourselves a pause. Like when those things happen, you know, one of the things I had to be reminded from a friend was, Hey, take a step, back. take a step back for just a second and assess this has happened. You deserve this. It's time to reflect. What do you need? Like I, I was pushing, 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 you, you know, my brain going forward. The fires were, were a prime example, um, mm -hmm. where this big thing had taken place and, I was in the go, 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 fix, repair, help mode. And I hadn't stopped to, to ask myself, what do you need? Who can you get it from? And how are you feeling? Or maybe it's, how are you feeling? What do you need? Who can get it from? Like one of those things. Yeah. And do you, do you, is there a thing we can do for ourselves? <laughs> you know, they have that, that, that therapy where they're like, tap, 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 tap. <laughs> Mine's more like slap, 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 wake up. You need you might need to take a minute and look around because you're the only one not paying attention to what's going on, you know, and you're, you, you, you got to take a moment. And, 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 and I think a lot of us, I'm sure do that because being busy feels valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's huge pressure from society to constantly be productive, right? So oh, well. there are, times when it's legitimately okay not to be productive all the time. <clears throat> and the other thing I wanted to say was sometimes, and y you know, this, this uh, I'm trying not to make a sweeping statement uh, and um, make comments about genders, <clears throat> but sometimes uh, 
women are socialized to be constantly giving, constantly looking out for other people, caring about their needs. I mean, you know, men can be like that too. Men can be great caregivers. Um, so it's looking out for if your personality naturally leans towards caring for everyone else, you may still try to care for other people in your grief. That's the moment that you step back. That like when you have experienced a major loss or a major stress in your life, it's okay to say, actually, I need to step back and start caring for myself because it's going to be hard to find people who are going to be constantly there caring for you. It's going to be hard for you to articulate your needs. So for example, if someone asks you in your grief, uh, what do you need? Your mind's going to go blank. You're not going to answer it's not going to come easily or naturally to say, oh, I, I, I need, I need someone to do the groceries for me Yes, because I don't have anything because, you know, oftentimes we lose our appetite and we just don't care. We don't care if we're eating or not yes. and we don't care if we're eating yes. healthily or not. And so it can be very hard at that, at that moment to kind of ask for help because we're always giving, giving, giving. And that, and, and for anyone who's listening, who might be in that boat, who might be kind of observing someone who's grieving and not knowing what to do, I would suggest don't ask them what they need, just give them the basics. So for example, show up at their door with a basket of food or groceries or cook them a meal and say, are you going to be home at this day and this time? Great. You could surprise them and just show up when you know that they're going to be home and say, here you go. I made an extra pan of lasagna for you. You know, something like that. So. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that. Comfort food never hurts. <laughs> That's right. I mean, there's a reason why it, people bring up tons of it to funerals. You know, it, it, it's it's so true is that the gesture of something homemade, first of all, is mm. very for me, and I'll speak specifically for me, my mother was a big food person. Um, we cooked in the kitchen and then we celebrated with food. It was her love language, mm. was making food for her family and serving them. And, 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 and she was amazing cook, studied all kinds of different kinds of cooking methods and different kinds of flavor profiles from Mexican to Chinese to Indian, you name it. So we, we always had a very colorful palette. We're introduced to a very colorful palette. And so for me, celebrating in the kitchen and being in that space is a very natural thing for me. So when someone brings me a dish, a homemade dish, it's a love gesture that really touches me. Um, but I also know that when you're in that space and that crisis mode and that grief mode, you're not hungry, but you will be. And it's probably going to be... <laughs> Not at the normal times of the day, mm. but maybe at 2.30 in the morning after you've had a really severe cry and you can't seem to get back to sleep and you open that refrigerator door and there's that lovely little thing of lasagna or whatever mm. that somebody had just, you know, chicken tandoori or something in your life and you just eat yeah, and you're fed. And that's such a nice thing. And I think we forget that, that we want to ask, what do you need? But just... Providing them with a nice dish is, is a big move. It's a nice gesture. It's easy to do too, you know. Yeah, and it's little, if you're a good cook. Yeah, or or buy it, you know, um, buy it from or sure. or, or or have a, a you know it's um, a restaurant or a fast food place deliver it to to their home, right? Well, like we, if you, if you we don't had like a, cooking... our friend. Yes, yes, uh, we had a family recently that we were helping through their grief, um, and and we were there in Texas. We we're here. And we couldn't just deliver. So what we did, we got them an Instacart yes, uh, that's right. order. And we just said, hey, here, here's, you know, $500 on Instacart. Get whatever your family needs this yeah. week. If you need more, let us know. We'll put more in there. You can order anything, you know, and have it yeah. delivered. We know you can't get from the house for whatever reason. Please take advantage of this. And it was such, they were so grateful because they could order anything yeah it, you know suddenly they were out of toilet paper and and you know it, the the effort to just leave the house just to go get basic supplies was not something that they felt they could even manage yeah. at this juncture 
So being able to just go on their phone and order it and have it delivered without even thinking about yeah. it was was a relief for them too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to explore the a few other things. You know, there's an importance of talking about empathy and compassion, which we've mentioned previously. And we we touched on that, but I want to go into vulnerability. Um, I mentioned before that vulnerability was some, like I think of it as a superpower and living a life, a full life despite loss requires an understanding of your vulnerability. And to me, your, your superpower has come from transitioning and pivoting from a life of loss and tragedy and using this this to 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 adapt and and adopt a, a different perspective, but also maintain a sense of vulnerability throughout the entire process while while embracing others. Like, can you walk us through a little bit about that? How how did you get through and from these tragic moments, and then now you're delivering it as a service to other people? Was there a, a time in your life where that didn't make sense, and all of a sudden you woke up and were like, "This is what I can do," or have you always been giving back? I think there was a pivotal moment in my life. I mean, I wasn't uh as a as a teenager, as a young adult, I wasn't thinking about uh being of service to others in the realm of loss and grief until I started caring as, as I I took a job, a sort of part-time freelance job that I saw in the newspaper to care for a woman who was dying of cancer and her five-year-old daughter. And it wasn't until, you know, I was caring for her for, for months until she, she passed because she knew it was terminal uh, and she wasn't going to recover from it. <clears throat> and it wasn't until afterwards that I realized that this is the work that I wanted to do to serve people. And particularly to support children so I did uh, so I went and that that five-year-old girl was just lovely I really liked her and um I then started uh, you know I trained in um I did my master's and I started working with young people for quite some time to be able to support them because I you know you say the word vulnerable who is most vulnerable than children right so I started working with the vulnerable and the elderly as well. And, um, but, but I focus mostly on children, which I, I just love their energy. I love uh, the joy. I, and I love their vulnerability and, and really s helping them find their voice, find their strength. And it just developed. So really from the age of 26, I started serving in, in the best way I knew how in whatever ways that I could. Uh, whatever whatever circumstances that they were going through, so it I, it started young. Um, most people aren't a carer at the age of twelve of someone with terminal illness, so it was I was <laughs> really thrown into the deep end um, to care for someone who was vulnerable. Uh, but I I really enjoyed it. I mean, it it was a beautiful experience she, because she was a beautiful woman, and she she really taught me a lot about how to be gracious and how to care for others, even in the last moments of her, of her days, in the last moments of her, of her life, she was thinking about other people and connecting other people and saying, Oh, you should meet so-and-so and this person might help you. And it was just incredible to watch. So yeah, I, I think, and I also want to say something else about vulnerability. I mean, I, I talked about it from your perspective, but I also, when I hear the word vulnerable, I also think about compassion as well. And the importance of being compassionate with yourself when you realize that you're vulnerable, because we all are vulnerable at certain points in our time, in our life. You know, sometimes we're strong and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we collapse, sometimes we're, you know, at a, at a, at a loss really uh, and collapsed. And we're vulnerable in that moment uh, to being judged, to to being criticized, because no one likes to see other people who are weak and helpless. You know, come on, get up, keep going. 
keep being productive. You know, that there's that mantra of keep going, fight, fight, fight to survive and keep going. But you know, when, when people are vulnerable or having what I call a, a duvet day where uh, duvet is, um, <laughs> you know yes. what I mean? Like a blanket day where they just want to hide under the oh, blanket yeah. the whole day in bed. You I've know? had, I love, I've had myself some, some duvet days. Don't you worry. And you know, and that, and that's okay. And that's, yeah. And I and I want to say something about having compassion for yourself when you're vulnerable because it is normal. It will happen. Uh, and by self compassion, I don't necessarily mean self pity. I mean just caring for yourself, like saying it's okay. You know what? Today, and I and I say this, and I encourage people to say say this to others. I'm having a grieving day today. I'm going to be okay tomorrow, but today I'm having a grieving day and I'm going to rearrange my life to acknowledge that. So, you know, I may not be doing as much today as I might another day. So I'm not going to be as productive. I'm not going to be meeting all my commitments. I might cancel things. Perfectly okay. You know, communicate that with others and say, and stand, stand in your in your fierce self-compassion, you know, you can like, and I've, and I've written blogs with this, like if there are holidays coming up, for example, and people expect you to be at a family function and you can't cope or you just don't want to go, it's all right to cancel and say, I'm having a grieving day. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it today. And to warn, not warn, to let people know ahead of time, I may cancel on this day. I'm just letting you know that I'm going to play by ear. I'm going to take each day moment by moment. And if I'm crying on a particular day and I can't make it out the door, that's where I'm at. And to just be strong in that and not have people go, really? Still? You're going to cancel? You're still crying? You know, all, all that kind of stuff. Put it aside because as I say, they, they can't offer, some people can't offer the same level of compassion that you can for yourself if you learn how to. And it's such an important skill to be able to do that, to learn how to offer yourself just some gentleness, saying it's all right. You know, it's like self-soothing. Well, it's honor. Mm. I think, you know, one of the things that um, I spoke about a few times that struck me about integrity um, is is about the promises and the love that we sh we show ourselves. When we build our calendars out and we build out the things that we're supposed to do and we cancel on ourselves, when we move our time around in order to accommodate another paying client, when we hit the snooze on our own lives, invariably what we're doing is telling our brain, and it remembers everything, every single time we do that, I'm discounting you. I'm discounting my value. I'm saying you're not important. You're not valuable. You can be moved. You can be manipulated. You can be changed. And in those moments when we fail to honor the part of ourselves that truly deserves this moment of grieving, what are we saying to ourselves? What, what scar, mental and psychological scar, are we creating in our lives when we don't honor the part of ourselves that deserves that moment. I had one recently where I, I did almost exactly what you said. I had several meetings that day and I just sent them all a message. So I'm having a day and I didn't say grieving day, but I was like, it's an emotional, this is a really hard one for me today. I'm so sorry, but I wish I could tell you it was a stomach ache or about whatever, you know, but it's not. I just emotionally, I'm not there today. And you deserve to have somebody that's there for these meetings. I can't do it. Uh, I, I will, you know, let's rearrange, let's reschedule. I really apologize. I got so much kindness mm. from people saying, um, thank you for sharing that vulnerable the vulnerability with me. Uh, of course I honor that we can reschedule whenever it's time. And for me, it's never the holidays. It's never the big things that really show up and bother me. It's weird moments, just random days where suddenly I feel like I've been punched in the gut by my emotions and that's probably like you were saying my little red balls were coming up you're like you know suddenly in, in finding their way to the top and popping for me you know because i've got something i've shoved down there so long ago that i didn't pay attention to 
And today I'm trying my best to learn about these vulnerable moments and honor these vulnerable moments, but not only honor them in the sense that I take care of myself, but by verbally saying to other people, I'm honoring my need today. I'm honoring my myself by doing this. And hopefully that helps others stand up and do it for themselves. Um, and we can role model in that way. And there's something really important here about being honest. So you, you know, you recognize that you didn't say, mm, I've got a tummy ache or I'm feeling physically ill, because that is far more acceptable in society to be physically ill than to have an emotionally uh, a wonky day. But you were really yes. honest. And they could see that transparency and that integrity by saying, I'm having an emotional day. We, we don't have to call it a grieving day. We can say, I'm having an emotional day. And yep. because it's so rare for someone to be that honest and to say that, to use that phrase and to say that, I think you got that level of, wow, you know, I can relate to this. I've had emotional days in the past and, and I can offer him that, that kindness. And I want to say one more thing that if you or if anyone encounters some kind of criticism or judgment, like when you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm not having a good day today, and you, instead of receiving kindness, you receive criticism and all that, I want people to understand that that's about them, not about you. So that's about them not having processed their grief and your feelings, your intense emotions that are coming up is activating their unprocessed emotions and they don't want to feel it so they try and shut you down because they're so used to shutting themselves down that they're trying to shut you down as well yes and that's not healthy yes and i think you're touching on something here additionally when we use those little white lies we're lying to ourselves we're lying about the feelings we're having right we're covering it up using a little lie because it might make somebody else feel comfortable. We're mm. doing a few things here. One, this disservice that we do to ourselves, which is to lie about how we're feeling and not sharing it with other people, undermines our integrity, our personal integrity. Yeah. Two, it when we find out someone doesn't support us, when we find out someone isn't in alignment, when we find someone doesn't respond positively, supportively to our situation when we're being honest, that's valuable information to yes, know it is. if you've been saving them from responding this way because you've been lying to them or giving mm. them an out you don't know if that's your real friend you have no idea if that person can support you so eventually down the line when something happens and teeters and they act in a certain way and you feel surprised you've denied yourself the information you've needed all along to make a determination about who you need in your life yeah. And you have now that information to go, oh, thank you for letting me know who you really are. That's important for me. I now know that I don't need to go to you for this. I now know I don't need to share these things with you. I now know I can carve that out of my life and put you a little further away if I need to. Because what I want to do is make sure I'm surrounded by people who do love and respect me and have integrity and compassion for me. And how do we do that if we're not being truthful with them about who we are? And how we feel. Yeah. And it's it's almost like, mm, I'm trying to think of a phrase. And the only phrase that comes to mind is birds of a feather flock together, right? Or, or no, here's sure. a better phrase. Like attracts like. So if you're wanting uh, someone to be kind to you, you know, be when you're kind to yourself, you know what that looks like. And you'll know how to recognize it in some someone else. And so I, I love what you said, Michael, about not just uh, being honest with yourself, but honoring your feelings so that you can recognize when someone else honors your feelings. Right? Yes, 100%. And speaking of this, you know, for listeners out there who are experiencing in grief, and, and I, I want to remind you guys, if you want Santu's help and her support, you can reach out to griefsupport.co.co and then forward slash free resources. She has a lot of wonderful resources on there. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, by the way, she also has her own podcast uh, and, and, and we want to support her. So if you loved listening to what she has to say and you want to be a supportive of Santu, please 
vote for her in the podcast competition for women. Uh, the link is called grief support, G R I E F grief support.co forward slash podcasts. And it'll be in the show notes as well. You can vote uh, as of this October, I believe, right? October 1st. Yeah, that's the deadline. Yeah. And I just want to say in case people are looking, um, I don't have my own podcast. I'm, I, I'm in a competition where I'm, um, where people can vote for me as a guest expert on podcasts. So yeah, there's, well, there's, there's other categories. <laughs> yeah. There's, I, there's other categories of other people, um, entering the competition as podcast hosts, but I've entered the competition uh -huh. as a guest expert. So on, oh, that, on that. that page that you've mentioned on the pod, on my grief support.co podcast page, I've got lots of other podcasts on there where I've been a guest and, you know, people are welcome to listen to those as well. I talk about loss and grief on those as well. So you can listen to them. Uh, or, you know, if you don't have a lot of time to listen, you can just simply click on a button to vote for me from having listened to this one. Well, I, <laughs> I'm going to just confess, talking to you is like having a verbal hug. I feel like every time I have you on on these calls, I just feel like I'm getting hugged every single time. And I, I, I it makes me feel loved and seen oh and appreciated. God, and I know that's not easy for a lot of people to just say. Um, well, I'm, but I'm, I wanted I'm to let you know that that's, that's, that's... it really does warm me. That I'm, I'm willing up because that's the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me, certainly on a podcast. Um, but just in general, that's, that's, wow, yeah. that's such a beautiful thing. It's to say. true. I, you have a energy about you that is vibrantly comforting for me. I hope that listeners can hear that through this uh, podcast, you know, when they're listening, that it is just so comforting. And I, I love that. I hope people will reach out to you. So in that vein, you know, are there, would you like to leave our listeners with anything final that you'd like to say before we sign off? Hmm. How to distill all that I know in one summary sentence. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, maybe I'll say something about the importance of getting early support and the importance I, I would say of counseling or, or therapy. And I'm not Mm, I think I, I want to say this because um, there's a lot of people out there who may call themselves a, a grief coach or a counselor. They may have had a life, one life experience in the realm of death or loss, and they think they can support others. And I think what I want to say is discern, just as you would discern which family member or friend you would disclose things to, discern carefully what professional you seek out to support you in your grief because grief is very complex there's a lot to it and there's there's a lot of theory that one needs to know so they need to know uh, grief counselors need to know about attach or I should call them therapists because counselors don't learn about attachment theory they don't learn about trauma theory and those two areas are really important for someone to know about in order to help you in a deep kind of way so that you're not leaving that counseling session going that didn't really help me much and I've just wasted all my time I'm still not much better than I was before and so I just want to encourage people to really do your due diligence in who you reach out for whether that's family friend or a professional do your due diligence because you don't, you want to be able to move forward and progress and to move forward in a way that helps you to lift your soul and to feel better. And I know that I can do that naturally with, with my personality type, but it, it's, it also comes naturally because I've been studying it for so long and studying the greats that came before me. Uh, whereas other people I've encountered in the field haven't studied the greats, haven't studied any kind of theory, and they're just kind of guessing at how to help you and reaching into their own experience. And you need to have a, a much broader understanding of what's going to help people than just what helped you in your own experience of loss. So I don't usually, I don't usually 
talk about that, but I was talking about that with someone else recently, and that's what's on my heart today and at the moment, um, because people can really suffer in their grief, and I, 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 I just, I can't bear to see people suffering unnecessarily because I've seen so much suffering myself. I want to help alleviate that as quickly and as easily as possible for people. So, yeah, I've got a real heart for lifting people out of their suffering. Well, you do. And you have, excuse me, you have a life's experience of both tragedy and overcoming study and hard work and effort and connecting. Ladies and gentlemen, a best-selling author, professional speaker and coach and trainer, Santu Carter. Uh, you can find out more information at her website, griefsupport.co. Um Thank you very much for your time and your efforts at making this world a better place when it comes to grief. If you are out there and you're listening, if you are suffering from something tragic, um, you know, we, we put on these coats, we put on this armor, we try to get through, but please remember, be very diligent and compassionate with your heart. It needs the time and the space and the attention uh, to heal from these things and you're worth it. And and it is very important. You find a qualified individual to help you get through there. And if you want that support and that help, you can certainly find it with Sanchu Carter, my beautiful, beautiful guest today on the fearless road podcast. Thank you so much oh, uh, for, for what you've done and for everything that you do and much love to you uh, today. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a great one. It's been a wonderful part two with Sanchu Carter. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please, Put your response, like, subscribe, do all those wonderful things, you know, down below or whatever it is uh, to let us know that you've enjoyed this episode. And if you need to find out more, like I've said, you can go to thefearlessroad.com. Uh, you can go on YouTube or wherever, and I'll put all the links and stuff in the show notes for you. But this has been Santu Carter on The Fearless Road with griefsupport.co. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Hey, stay fearless. All right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Absolutely. Ha, 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 ha.